Okay, so hopefully almost around here. So um, this is um, Open BTS workshop, and uh, so the David Burgess is the creator of Open BTS, and then we have the chamber is a participant in Open BTS and contributor. Uh, we will be running this workshop. Most of the workshop will be run by uh, most time of the most of the workshop will be run by David because well, he is a creator and he will uh, go through the architecture of Open BTS and uh, through the G's and basics, and then uh, we will uh, have a short. Um, Presentation about what you need to, to run OpenTTS, uh, a GSM network in your laboratory or uh, wherever you want, uh, and uh, what are legal responsibilities for um, doing it improperly, which is the important part. Uh, so, while we are setting up the recording, uh, how many of you? Uh, Look at the open BTS Okay, so we have people who are unknown understanding of open BTS, right? Uh, okay, how many of you look at into GSM networks who understand this partially how they get the rate? Okay. Okay, more hands. So a few people who are newbies. Okay, so if well, if the stuff is uh, slightly uh, boring for you, just wait a little bit. And uh, we have time for questions after uh, the presentation uh, of the GSM basis and of basically after each part of the presentation. And oh, I think people could ask questions. Yeah, if anyone has a question at any point during the presentation, just show you. Yes, yeah, so I'd much rather have a discussion than just sit there and run them out for an hour. Yeah. I mean, if it's like a huge question, probably it's better to save it for, for the like for, for the after the presentation of the talk, everyone. But if it's a small question, then hesitate to ask right away. It's recording. And uh, the plan for next year is uh, to implement a little CGS and If there is anyone who has an opportunity, so that's it, and uh, <coughs> the purchase and the first part of our workshop. Okay. So. Different people come into this with different knowledge of different things. So if I'm talking about something you already know about, there's a fair chance that somebody else in the room doesn't know about it. So just please bear with us because there's a lot to cover in a fairly short amount of time. So very quickly, you're talking about the history of GSM. Um, the, the original design, the original planning of GSM started in 1982. Um, and by Skip a lot of that. Service started rolling out in the mid 90s, and by 2009, GSM counted for about 80% of all cellular service worldwide. It still does. Just because GSM is an old technology doesn't mean it's dead. There are new GSM networks being built right now in many parts of the world. And most carriers believe they'll continue to operate their 2G networks for at least another 10 years. So GSM will be with us always, even if it's not going anywhere soon. Um, in fact, uh, uh, Max and I were talking earlier, we we're both of the opinion that 3G will come and go and be replaced by LTE before 2G GSM disappears. Is that their consensus? So we're going to go, we're going to talk about the structure of GSM, in particular in the context of OpenBTS, starting at layer one, starting at the lowest part of the physical layer and working our way up. Um, and in layers one and two, this is, this is open BTS is just like any other GSM system, but in layer three, it sort of departs from the conventional GSM architecture. Um, it's in layers that are similar to those in the OSI model, but uh, GSM development actually sort of predated the standardization of the OSI layer model. So the layer numbers don't exactly correspond to that. So in layer one, we have a physical layer, it's all about bits and waveforms. 
Layer two is the data link layer that makes link, that makes layer one look reliable. And then layer three is the connection management layer. And this is where telephone calls and text messages actually happen. It's where things start to happen that look like a telephone system that you would actually recognize as, as a telephone network. I'm going to start by talking about physical layer layer one. Um, you have a basic problem in the design of any radio network, which is how do multiple users share the physical resource. The oldest way of solving that problem is frequency, just simply frequency multiplexing, where you give every transmitter a specified frequency, every transmitter runs on its frequency, every transmitter for the most part is one user, and that's it. Um, another approach to this is you can take your whole spectrum and let everyone use it together and time slice that spectrum. So people, different users use the spectrum at different times. Um, this can be done in a synchronous manner using time slotting, or it can be done asynchronously using a local protocol like what you see on 8 to 11. Uh, GSM does it synchronously using time slotting, and it's not all that they do. In fact, what GSM does is it uses both techniques. So you have frequency channels, and then each frequency channel is divided into time slots. So you can potentially, you know, have eight physical resources on each time, on each radio channel, and then multiple radio channels running on the same base station. So when you specify a physical resource in GSM, you have to specify it in terms of frequency and time. So this is the basic eight slot structure of GSM. Uh, each of these time slots is just under 577 microseconds in duration, uh, which corresponds to 156 and a quarter channel bits, you know, bit periods on that, on that um, link. And the, the, the part is, the, the extra quarter bit comes in because each of these time slots is preceded by a guard period where there's no transmission, and that guard period is not an integer number of um, consideration. At least it doesn't happen. So, it's a term that's going to get thrown around a lot when you work in GSM. Um, most Americans call this an ARFIN. Um, depending on where you're from and how you choose to pronounce your acronyms, you might pronounce it differently. Um, but it's the absolute radio frequency channel number. And what it is in the GSM system, you have radio channels at 200 kilohertz space, and they're actually wider than 200 kilohertz, which means adjacent channels overlap and can't be used in the same cell. But um, these frequencies are assigned in a, in a very fixed sequence, and, and they're numbered. So if you say Arfkin, um, I don't know, ARPM 867 in the DCSA 200 band that refers to actually a pair of frequencies, a specific pair of frequencies. One is being used for upwind and one is being used for downwind. So GSM, like nearly all cellular systems, is frequency duplex. And what we mean by that is that the client device and the server device are transmitting on different frequencies so that they can transmit and receive simultaneously. So the uplink is what we call the signal going from the handset to the base station. The downlink is what we call the signal going from the base station to the handset. And in any given GSM band, when you specify a particular arc pin, you're actually specifying a pair of frequencies with a fixed offset. So these are common bands worldwide. Um, ITU region one is, um, if I'm correct, uh, Europe. <laughs> ITU Region 3 is, um, well, Europe and Asia, ITU Region, region 3 is um, Africa and the Middle East, or the Near East, as you call it here, and um, ITU Region 2 is the Americas. So, in most parts of the world, the standard GSM bands are the um, 900 band. Uh, actually, PGSM 900 is probably most commonly used in DCS 1800. For example, the GSM <coughs> test networks that are running here at in the conference or running the DCS 1800 band. Um, in North America, it's DSM 850, TCS 1900, because different, I guess. Um, these are the standard bands. And you can tell by the placement here what the duplexing offsets are. The duplexing offsets in the high bands are larger than in the low bands. <coughs> And the last uh, two bands, are the, uh, they are commonly used for testing, uh, or uh, they are commonly used for everything? They're commonly used for everything. Normally what you find, lower bands, lower bands have better propagation. 
you can cover larger areas in the lower bands than the high bands. The original intention was that the higher bands are mostly be used for urban service. Yeah. Um, the lower bands are mostly be used for rural service. In practice, in any given country, both of these bands are fairly heavily occupied. So in, in rural areas, the low bands filled up first, but operators came back in and got licenses in the high bands to use them and anyway, even the performance. It's not as good. So both bands are used for service, and in most countries, both bands are fully licensed everywhere, even if they're not being, even if they're fallow in some places, they're fully licensed. There's very little unlicensed <coughs> spectrum of these bands. Okay. There are a few small examples that we'll talk about. So I've got, got a question. That does the time slot uh, of uh, 500 milliseconds come from something mathematically, uh, mathematical calculation? Or just, uh, this yeah, is yeah. The, there, there's a sort of numerology to the timing of GSM, and it's um, there are two things that drive that numerology. One is the the vote. And it's, it's actually it's 577 microseconds, but the two things that drive all these crazy timing numbers in GSM, one is the, the vocoder frame length of 200 milliseconds. So it's important that an integer number of vocoder frames can be transmitted in an integer number of time slots. It's not a one-to-one -one correspondence, but there has to be a, a reasonably rational integer relationship between the two. The other is that the clocks in this system are derived from 13 megahertz OCX. So every, every clock in GSM is derived from a 13 megahertz source. So it's the interaction of those two requirements that generate this sort of strange pattern of numbers that you see. Just another question. Um, the bands we have on in the table are covered by a simple dual band GSM phone. So there's no special phone needed to have been covered. So if you have a dual band phone, it will usually cover one low band and one high band. Okay. Um, but most phones, most phones in the market are quiet. And by quad band, but what we mean is they cover EGSM 900, GSM 850, GSM 850, and also three band Yeah, the least the least supported in terms of hardware is PCS 1900, which is used mostly. It was originally intended for your urban service in North America. It's the least supported, but like I said, a lot of, a lot of quad band phones in the market these days. Sometimes what you'll find in a dual band phone will support a low band. It will support a, a North American band in one side and a rest of the world band in the other. So you like you'll have a phone that's like GSM 900 piece. <sighs> okay, you're gonna see my code again. I gotta change it. Um, <laughs> so it's your board. Yeah. Thanks. Um, <laughs> really <have> <laughs> so you know, you'll see something. For example, it'll be it'll be GSM 900 in the low band, PCS 1900 in the high band. That way you have a phone that works everywhere in the world. Although it doesn't look quite as well. A um, little more talking about duplexing. Um, and this, this will come up if you listen to Sylvan's talk um, later this evening. Uh, the topic of duplexing plays kind of heavily in, in what he's doing. Um, so there are two types of two ways to do duplexing. One is time division duplexing, where you transmit and then you receive, and you transmit and you receive. And there's frequency division duplexing, we transmit and receive simultaneously on the same channel. Um, the cheapest thing to implement is time division duplexing. And the reason that it's cheaper is because if you do frequency division duplexing, you actually have to have some physical filter to prevent the uplink and downlink frequencies from, basically you have to have some filter to prevent your, your transmitted downlink signal from jamming your uplink. Um, so we do a little show and tell. Um, these are duplexers. What's inside are a bunch of tuned cavities. So one side of this is a filter that only passes high band signals, and the other side is a filter that only passes low band signals. And then you can take the high band and low band and run them through the same antenna. And you have these, the signals are isolated in terms of power, power ratio for the isolation is about a factor of a billion. So it's an aluminum brick. It's an aluminum breaker with a bunch of tuned filters. Um, there'll be a but this, the problem with this is you're not going to put this on a handset. <laughs> um, it's big. It's hard to find one well made for less than $150. Um, it's not a good thing to have a handset. So what they did at GSM that was extremely clever. Um, that was 
much. Yeah. What they did in GSM was extremely clever. Yes. Uh, I have a picture. Damn it. Um, is that since the handset only has to transmit on one time slot at a time, you can offset the timing of the uplink and downlink signals so that when the handset is transmitting in its time slot, the base station is transmitting on some other time slot and the handset doesn't have to listen. So there's a three slot offset between uplink and downlink that allows you to build a hand, even though the base station is transmitting and receiving on both frequencies constantly because it's talking to multiple handsets, the handset itself doesn't have to do that. It can just switch back and forth with just a cheap switch instead of a duplexer. But that's also why when you look at classes of GPRS equipment, uh, when you go above a certain class for GPRS, the equipment becomes much more expensive. And that's because it, it, GPRS, is used, as you use more and more slots to get higher bandwidth, you eventually reach a point that you're no longer protected. You're no longer protected by the timing offset, and you actually have to duplex, and then I have to put a ceramic duplex on the handset and drive the cost of the body. Thank you. Another little piece of GSM trivia. Um, and, and oddly enough, if you actually start working with OpenBTS, all this will become important. Um, the base station controls the output power level of the handset all the time. So what happens at the base station, you have some minimum target power level that you want that the base station wants to see. And there's no need for it to receive the signal any stronger than that. So what the base station does is it's constantly telling the handset what power to transmit. And constantly calibrating that power to hit some target, some, some signal to noise ratio target in its receiver. And if you, you know, if you get below that target, you lose your link. And if you get above that target, you're wasting power. Um, and you're also straining the receiver in the base station. The other thing the handset has to, the base station has to do is control the time of the gas because what happens, um, the guard period between the GSM time slots, there's a guard period, about five symbol periods, but that guard period corresponds to a physical distance in terms of propagation delay of about 500 meters. And that means that if you have two handsets that are transmitting on adjacent time slots and they differ in distance by more than 500 meters, that their transmitted time slots will actually overlap as they arrive at the base station. They'll be interfering with each other. So the base station is constantly telling hands, the base station tells the handset to advance its internal clock by a certain number of symbol periods. So that when the frames, when the slots are transmitted by all the different handsets in the area, even though they're being transmitted at staggered times, when they go through their propagation, through their different propagation delays, they line up perfectly at the base station. Um, one side effect of this, it means that the base station is constantly estimating the distance of the handset the whole time that they're engaged in communication. So you can actually look at the physical layer parameters of, of the running channel. Damn! You look at the physical layer parameters of the running channel and get an estimate of the distance get an estimate of the distance between the handset and the base station. This is done on a channel called the associate control channel. Okay. So believe it or not, we're done with the wearable. It's, like I said, it's nothing at all like Wi-Fi. Um, it's a lot more like a T1 line that somebody put on the radio. We're going to talk very, very briefly about layer 2. Layer 2 is tedious. And that's me saying that. So, um, here's the problem. Layer 3, which we're about to talk about, generates messages of variable length and it expects them to be delivered reliably. When you send a message in Layer 3, one of two things is supposed to happen within a predictable amount of time. Either the message was delivered or the link will be, the link will be terminated and the call will be dropped. One of those two things must happen within about 10 seconds when you transmit something in Layer 3. Um, meanwhile, down in Layer 1, frames disappear from Layer 1 all the time. Um, standard carrier grade quality of service in a GSM network is a 3% frame erasure rate in layer 1. That's, that's normal. You've, you've used telephone calls with frame loss rates of 10%. You do it all the time, you probably don't even notice. You don't actually start to notice the frame losses until you get up around 12 to 15%. You start to notice something's wrong. Um, so what layer 2 does, it, it, it implements um, a message uh, segmentation, sequencing, and retransmission protocol. Um, if you're familiar with ISDN's LAPD, um, which is the layer two, it's the link layer protocol for ISDN, 
Um, LAPD-M used in GSM is a simplified form of LAPD. If you're like a hardcore old school networking person, you've heard of HDLC. These are all HDLC derivatives. How many people heard of HDLC? Okay, yeah, yeah. So these are all HDLC derivatives. Um, so HDLC lives on in your GSM handset. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll continue for another few years. So we're up to layer three. Like I said, this is, this is the part where stuff starts to look like a telephone system. It's the part where messages actually start to mean things. You can like read a message and, and, and actually associate with something in the physical world. Layer 3 is built in sublayers. And in any given GSM transaction, you usually have three sublayers at play. The lowest sublayer is the radio, it's always the radio resource management sublayer. This is the layer that we'll talk about it creates and destroys radio channels. Mobility management sublayer, which takes care of all your security features, authentication, and also keeps track of where the handset is in the neighborhood so that in the in the network so they can receive inbound calls correctly. And then your third layer, your third sublayer, is usually call control, sometimes a short message service. We'll talk about both of those. There are some other more obscure ones in here like USSD and um, radio resource location protocol. It's usually one of these two. The important thing about the sublayers is that when a handset wants service, it has to establish a connection in one sublayer before it moves into the next sublayer to try to start establishing connection. So the sequence of events when the phone wants service, it first establishes connection in the radio resource layer. So if there's a written you, you have a dedicated radio channel. And then it establishes a connection to the mobility management layer where you verify the identity of the handset, the identity of the handset. And then you start acting in the call control layer. So in ISDN systems, you don't really need these. These are the only, this is the only layer you have. Um, because, you know, in fixed line phones, you just, these sublayers just don't exist. There's something that corresponds to them. So, radio resource management. You assign, you, you know, you create and destroy and assign radio channels, you page handsets. Um, there's a, a, um, a unicast channel called the Common Control Channel that's used for sending out paging, paging messages when a handset has an inbound, you know, an inbound call or an inbound text message. It starts receiving paging messages on the Common Control Channel, carrying its Timsy or its Timsy. That's done in the radio resource somewhere. It generates the beacon. The beacon is a set of uh, a set of messages that are transmitted continuously on a channel called the broadcast control channel. And these messages uh, describe the configuration of the base station, who runs the base station, what services does it offer, how is it, how are its physical resources arranged so that the handset has that access. So all the data elements in in radio in a radio resource sublayer are um, their descriptions of physical parameters. That's, that's the data element in the description of physical parameters and the states of the system. And because this presentation is supposed to be short, we actually left out a lot of information about GSM channel types. There's a whole zoo of channels, of different subservices, channels and subchannels in GSM. Um, but they fall into three basic categories. Non-dedicated channels, which are broadcast or unicast channels. Dedicated channels, and then within dedicated channels, two subcategories. DM channels, which are sig dedicated signaling channels that correspond to the D channels in ISDM, and BM channels, which are dedicated um, error channels, media channels that correspond to the B channel in ISDM. So, sort of the, the channel structure of GSM. Okay, next up, mobility management. Um, the key functions of mobility management, one is to keep track of, again, where a phone is in a network. <clears throat> so let's say you're, um, you're a smallish to medium-sized carrier like AT&T, and you operate something like 63,000 cell sites across North America. Um, a phone has an inbound call. You don't want to page the phone on every single one of those 63,000 cell sites because you won't have enough capacity on your paging channels if you do that everywhere all the time. So you have to figure out where that phone is in the network so that the paging message goes to the appropriate subset of base stations. Um, 
mobility management is what's meant to broadcast it. Yes. Okay. Well, it's, it's a unicast message, but yeah, it's yeah. broadcast. It's yeah. unencrypted, and you want to see it. You know, like if you have Osmocom BB or something, you can just read the paging channel. You can see who's, you can see who's receiving inbound transactions in your area just by following the paging channel. Okay. Mobility management, um, and you authenticate users. Um, you create session encryption keys in the sublayer. The data elements in this sublayer are identity tokens and um, authentication tokens. So that goes for the data elements. Finally, call control. Um, what does call control do? It, it sets up and tears down phone calls. Um, call control and GSM comes directly from ISD and it's nearly identical. Call, GSM call control is nearly identical to ISM's call, ISD and call control. Um, and again, the data elements in this sublayer are um, telephone numbers, um, call status codes, and things called bearer capability elements that describe what sets of services are supported by a handset. So when you go to set up a telephone call to a handset, you might want to know what codec set that handset supports so that you can choose an appropriate codec on your, to run your beverage Now what we can talk about is very quickly is SMS. Um, in layer three, very little happens to SMS. Layer three is really just a pass through to SMS. Um, everything interesting in SMS happens in layers four and five. Nothing, nothing worse. We can stop talking about sublayers now. Talk briefly about address and address types. That's the important part. Yes. Address types in GSM. Um, the MZ. The MZ is a, usually a 15 digit number that's in your SIM card. Um, it's basically your identity. From the standpoint of the telephone network, you're an MZ. That's who you are. You are your MZ. Um, end, end of story. Uh, in, information encoded in the MZ includes the issuing carrier. So if you're, if you're, you know, for example, watching a paging channel and you're watching MZs fly by on a paging channel by looking at the upper digits of the MZ, you can tell uh, what carrier or what country issued the SIM card. So, for example, we run at, at Range Networks. We have a test license to run um, a network in the open um, in San Francisco. And we run it in the DCS 1800 band, but we get lots and lots of foreign visitors trying to attach to our network. And you can spot the ones who don't have roaming service in the United States um, because when they try to attach to our network, uh, they tell us the network where they last received service. So you can see you know, phones from Taiwan and China and obscure countries in Africa that haven't had service since they've been in North America and they're trying to attach to us. And they keep trying, we know they're in the neighborhood because they keep trying to attach to us several times a day. Um, so another identity is the TIMSI, the Temporary Subscriber Mobile subscriber Identity. Because the MZ leaks so much information, uh, the GSM network uh, also defines a temporary identity type. <coughs> it's just a 32-bit number, supposedly assigned randomly, though, although in practice always assigned by it from a counter, um, that is used to substitute for your MZ. Uh, whenever possible in the air interface. And this is just what we've been exposed to. In a, in a really good network, the MZ only appears during the initial attach. So you'll, you'll attach, you'll do an initial registration with the network using your MZ. The network will turn on encryption and then assign you a TIMSI. And then from that point on, the MZ will never appear in the clear again. And, and by what is when you're changing the cells? If you go from one cell to another cell, then uh, the MZ is again used for uh, to generate the TIMZ. Actually, it's not supposed to be. Yeah. <laughs> in, in practice, it may be used if you go from one location area to another. TIMZs may be local to location areas. And when you enter a new location area, although if you actually read the specs, this number is supposed to be network-wide. This number is supposed to be in the operator's VOR. So it's only when you move from one VLR service area to another that you should see this happen. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
In practice, though, if you watch the paging on the common control channel, you'll see anywhere from 10% to 25% of the paging is being done by MC. And if the phone's being paged by MC, it has to answer by MC. So, two other numbers. Um, the internet, the IMEI. The IMEI is basically the serial number of the cell phone. In GSM, the IMI, IMEI is not really used for much except to detect stolen phones. There's a database called the Equipment Identity Register that's just a, a list of IMEIs of stolen, the phones have been reported stolen. Um, the only thing the IMEI is really used for is for checking this identity. Um, and then the MSI SDN, that's your actual telephone number. Uh, so the phone doesn't know it's on MSI SDN. It, there's no reason, if you search through your handset, there's no reason for your handset to know it's on telephone number. Because all a telephone number is is a routing address. And because this routing address is delivered, because calls are delivered over dedicated point-to-point -point links, there's no need for the phone to know its own address. <coughs> so the network knows its address. The MSI is the the association exists in the HOR. It doesn't exist in the phone. There's no need for the phone. Um, you also, you know, we talk about locked phones. Um, basically, a locked phone is a phone whose firmware has been abused so that it will only accept sense from specific. Uh, it's a very common practice in North America. I've heard it's becoming more common in Europe. I'm sorry, it's true. Cool. <laughs> so, any other questions before we stop talking about the GSM side? Could you go back? <laughs> hey. Yeah. <clears throat> IMEI is not really cared about. Is it true when I change the IMEI on my phone, uh, nobody really cares? Is it, what if I set it to zero uh, phone? Nobody cares. For the most part, nobody cares. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, although there was a case in, in India a few years ago where so many cheap knockoff, Nokia knockoffs were coming in from China that all had the same IMEI. <laughs> <laughs> Barty Airtel eventually noticed that, that there was this huge pool of phones out there that all had the same, I, the same IMEI, and they set up a little kiosk all over the country where you could come in and get your phone reflashed to have a proper, unique IMEI. So. <laughs> when you change phones, now we just zero IMEI. Yeah. I understand that if you use some uh, Android uh, emulators, they'll have an IMEI of zero. Mm -hmm. So that's one way to identify like, running it in, in an emulator for Android. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, David, you mentioned quickly their encryption. I don't know if you're going to talk about that at any point in the future, but I, it's something I kind of tried to get a handle on and didn't quite get it. Is that we can talk about encryption stuff, but there's actually not a lot in here about encryption. We can talk about it separately. <coughs> Later? Or yeah, we'll talk about it. Remember to bring it up. Okay. It's some interesting things. Could you, could you talk briefly about uh, SIM locking and, and how that how that works? How the, the SIM is locked to a particular carrier? Well, the, this, it's not so much the SIM is locked, it's the, the, the firmware on the phone is set to reject SIMs that don't come from for, uh, that don't come from specific operators. Is that in a particular, like, is it looking at a particular um, Set of bits, um, yeah. That so, the uh, manufacturer or well, no, the ID. yeah, the MZ, the SIM contains an MZ, and the first six digits of that MZ identify the issuing carrier. So, the first three digits of the mobile country code, and the next three digits of the mobile network code. So, we're looking at those six digits, you have a globally unique identifier for every carrier in the world. And, you know, the first? the first three digits are something called the mobile country code. Which is different from the E one sixty four telephone dialing country. It's a different address space. Um, and then the next three digits of the mobile network code that identify the carrier within a particular country. Mobile country codes are issued by the ITU, and mobile network codes are issued by regulated authorities within each country. The exception to that being mobile country code nine hundred one, which is a special country code for non geographic services like satellite phones. And within Mobile Country Code 901, the IT also issues mobile.
but the short of it is that you can look at the first six digits of an MZ and never issue it. So you can set the firmware in your phone to look at the first six digits of the MZ and say, oh, that's not my MZ, and just refuse to use the center. Yeah? Is the e in the phone itself or in the chipset. So tells the phone the chipsets I have the email so and so or does the chipset uh, know that's my MZ? Um, you said the IMEI? Huh? It, when you say chipset you mean the baseband? Yeah, uh, yes. Sorry. As opposed to the application processor? Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah the IMEI is um, to the best of my knowledge, in most phones, the IMEI is a property of the baseband processor. Although it is changeable, it, it can be reprogrammed. Um, it's not something that most people do, but it can be done. <coughs> so, I mean, your typical smartphone is still just, um, your typical smartphone is really usually just a small tablet computer with a JSON motor in it. So voice over IP. So unlike you know in your in your normal GSM hierarchy, the base station itself is a really dumb device. It doesn't really do anything above layer two. Um, radio resource management, which we talked about, is handled by an entity in the network called a base station controller, BSC. And then everything above um, everything above the radio resource sublayer of layer three is handled by other entities in the core network, in particular, the mobile switching center, the visitor, the visitor location register, and the home location register. So in OpenBTS, we don't do all that. And I, we just don't. What we do instead is we terminate radio resource management internally, and then we do everything else using uh, SIP, using voice over IP protocol called SIP. So we're going to start talking a little bit about voice over IP. Um, in the beginning, the old analog the old analog ESTM. Again, telephone numbers form an address space. Um, if you're new to telephony, that's sort of a new idea that might get you on the side of the head, but they're an address space like any other. Uh, and the only purpose of telephone number is to route a, route a call to a specific device. It's its own 